Hey there, everyone. I'm Stephanie Gomolka, Auction.com correspondent. Our live coverage continues here at CrimeCon. And as you can see, there's a large crowd here coming through the hallway. As we continue our coverage here, I'm joined with former Scotland Yard criminal behavior behavioral analyst, sorry, that's a mouthful, Laura Richards. And then we also have Deborah and Tara Newell here from Dirty John, the Dirty Truth. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Oh, thank you so much for having us. I know you guys have been super busy here. Um, you just wrapped up a panel and we were able to see the room was super packed. How, how did that go? How, what was the response like? It was incredible. I mean, practically the whole ballroom was full. And Deb put her head out and said, oh, there's barely anyone here. And I put my head out and it was packed. <laughs> so you could hear a pin drop as we were talking. And I think people hearing Deborah's story and Tara's story, there's still so much more to it that you would think that everyone has consumed this story on the podcast, The Bravo Show on Oxygen. But there's still more I learn when I listen to Deborah and Tara every time. Yeah. Deborah, the last time we spoke with you, it was after the Bravo show and after the podcast. And now, Tara, this is the first time I'm meeting you. But I just want to ask you, after the documentary and even now after the panel, what is it like now? What's the response like? And what has your day-to-day -day life been like? I believe that what's been really important is getting the word out there about what John did do. And there are so many victims out there. So at this point, it's all about spreading the word and also about people learning the signs of coercive control amongst sociopaths, psychopaths, narcissists. And I want to get more into coercive control and you know what are those warning signs, especially with you, Laura and Deborah, what you experienced. Tara, what has it been like for you since the documentary came out? Well, it's been a complete life-changing event. I'm not so much like the tra well, the trauma was so life-changing, but after everything came out, it was highly publicized. So it just, you can't have a normal life after that. And so I really had to take a step back and figure out like, where, what do I want to do? Like, what do I want to come out of this? And then now we're just speaking about it, speaking about, um, well, for me, PTSD, um, coercive control, and then also just like what you could do to actually survive an attack like I went through. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that really strikes me about you, Tara, is you're so open about your journey, as well as you are, Deborah. Um, I see on an Instagram post, you know, I, I think you were in Disney and you mentioned PTSD in the caption. Oh, yeah. And that's, I mean, the advocacy and like doing that there for other people to see can be such an impactful thing. Um, you know, why do you want to do that and why is that important to you? Well, I just want to show that women can have a voice and that they don't have to hide inside the house and cower and just feel sorry for themselves, that they can actually go out, have a life. And yeah, there is struggles with PTSD, but you know what? You're going to have to work through it to get better. Mm -hmm. has, how much has your relationship changed from, I don't want to say before John, because this story isn't about him, but you know, before these life events happened and after, like between the two of you, and, and I know you have the, your other daughter and your other children. Well, we were really close before, but obviously during the whole John incident, there were issues, uh, he separated us, so on, but now we're, we're great. Uh, there's more of an appreciation. Do you want to add anything? That's, oh, that sums well, it, it up. It just like, brought us really close together. Yeah. And I think that it's just such a bond now that I like, none of my other friends have with their mom. So yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. Laura, let's get back to coercive control. Can you kind of define it for us? Because I, we were talking about this earlier. It kind of feels like a lot of women can go through this. And it's like we're finally giving a name to that kind of behavior. Can you describe it and define it for us? Yeah. I mean, Dirty John was all about coercive control and manipulating and the deception to occupy every part of Deborah's life. So it's a pattern of behavior, and it's a strategic pattern, so it's planned. And it can be lots of different things tailor-made to the victim. So charm, for example, is part of a control tactic, and so is love bombing, where somebody, you know, that intense romance that happens where, with John Meehan, for example, he was, uh, his trade craft was getting women to fall in love with him. And the love bombing is really a, a real targeted campaign where you mit match and mirror someone's wants, desires, and their needs. And yes, many women do experience this, but 
we've got to understand that coercive control can be so many different aspects of behavior. It can be about isolation. It can be about exploitation. It can be depriving someone of their basic human rights. And it can be dressed up as loving and caring behavior. So it, it's grooming, effectively, where you brainwash someone. And about 51% of victims don't even know they're being groomed and coercively controlled. So it's important here in the US to criminalize coercive control so that it's a crime. All the non-physical things that happen as a pattern of domestic violence to gain power and control, that that must be criminalized and, and taken seriously because it correlates with murder. Yeah. Um, for anyone watching and you want to know more details about Dirty John as we're having this discussion, right after this, head to auction.com. There's articles and you can learn more about the documentary Dirty John, The Dirty Truth. But Deborah, I want to ask you, you know, in terms of course of control, what were the warning signs or the things you were experiencing that kind of coincide with what um, Laura was describing? Basically, John uh, checked off every box on the list wow. <laughs> uh, from very... Uh, from all the words, studying me, knowing what to say, what would make me fall in love with him, to basically isolating me, which is a big one, uh, to basically doing chores for me, um, controlling me. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot that he did. Uh, it was 100% coercive control. Yeah, and usually it's kind of hard to see it even from your own perspective. Tara, you were there while this was happening and unfolding. What was that like for you? What were you seeing? Well, I just saw the red flags. Like, he tried to isolate her. He didn't want to engage with me. He didn't want to look me in the eyes. Um, he didn't... I had dogs, and he didn't, like... He loved dogs, but they didn't like him. And, like, they were just like, oh, I just don't want to say hi to him. And then they got anxiety from being there and stuff around him. So it's like the dog sensed him. So, yeah, you know, just listen to your instinct. dogs. instinct, yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, in terms of... No, that's, that's a really important thing. And in terms of Deborah, like most people when they're going through a relationship and they're experiencing red flags or their instinct is telling them something, it can be difficult in especially romantic relationships. Um, if you really like the person or they are love bombing you, how important is having someone like a Tara, a daughter, a friend, a bystander to step in? And then my second part of that question is, what's the right way to do that? Is there a right way to intervene if you feel like something is off? I mean, firstly, just, you know, with the, with the initial question, that there's no right or wrong answer to any of this, right. but the gut instinct never lies. So many times women would tell me, it's at this point that I felt something was wrong, and then I gave, you know, a rationalization to it, or I minimized it, or somebody else minimized it. And so you cast that doubt aside, and maybe the abuser has a perfect, ex you know, perfect reason for explaining why they did A rather than B. Um, and it can really be dressed up as attentiveness and, and as loving behavior. So I would say to people, talk to your friends about your relationships. You know, don't uh, allow it to be a whirlwind. Take your time to get to know someone. Because again, people can do a false impression uh, projection. So they're in the honeymoon phase, acting as if they're one thing to get you hooked in and get you snared. And then once you're hooked in and you're emotionally invested, it's then that they start the isolation and they can start with other tactics. So I always say, you know, make sure you talk to your daughters if you're starting to date someone, talk to your friends. Don't allow someone to isolate you or to move area or to quit your job or to change too many things and take your time to get to know that person. Mm -hmm. There's no rush. There's, there's no need to hurry a relationship along because actually the courting, the courting stage of a relationship is the most fun. So why rush it? Why ruin that, you know, getting to know someone? And, you know, you, you just don't get a second chance to get that right. And for Deb, she understood the red flags right from the start. But then he said all the right things. Mm. And so her feeling was assaged and as much as her daughters were trying to tell her, she was so heavily invested in the relationship and didn't want to, uh, I think in some ways admit that things were going bad. Once you've been isolated, you become entrapped. You know, and so when people move away from you, it, it's doubly entrapping and it ends up pushing you back to the abuser. Right. And it also can be very difficult to leave. You both have, all three of you have spoken about this before, about that there's this fear. Can you talk about some of the reasons why it's hard for women to leave? 
I mean, the overriding reason is uh, fear, basically. And fear can be dressed up as many things. Fear of admitting failure of a relationship, when everybody else was saying, well, I told you so, I told you so. It can be fear of the, the abuser, the repercussions. You know, Deborah knew she couldn't just leave, she couldn't just walk out the door. And some women really understand if they stay, they die. If they leave, they die. They're in a no-win situation. So fear is what normally entraps somebody to stay. And you may well report it to the police. And if they don't take you seriously, you know that that individual, it's like kicking over the hornet's nest, a wasp's nest. They're probably going to be even angrier. And no police or law enforcement can protect someone 24 seven. And it does take someone on average about seven times to successfully leave an abusive partner. Right, and there were a multitude of reasons why you couldn't leave right away as well that you went through. Yes. Um, the first, I only stayed one time, uh, but there you cannot just walk away uh, or it puts your life in danger. So there, there are steps that you have to plan through in order to be able to leave safely. Mm -hmm. During the panel, um, we had someone that was able to watch it. Um, and I just want to talk about one thing that you guys mentioned. Deborah, you mentioned the Ovaltine woman. Can you describe what that wa who she was and, and, and um, what you talked about in the panel? Well, the Ovaltine woman, um, we showed a picture, obviously, on, on stage. And what we went through, what I went through, was just very surreal. Uh, but her walking into the home, uh, taking a shower, putting on my clothes, and then to walk in and see this woman just sitting in a chair was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And this was while you were dating John, and it was just a, a scary this was, encounter? This, this was fairly early on uh, in the relationship, and I believe that uh, it was to get cameras in the house. Got it. Got it. And there's never been a confirmation that it was related to John. That was kind of your gut instinct about that it's situation. It's my gut. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Got it. And so in terms of coming to an event like CrimeCon, you guys have really been advocates with telling your story from the very beginning. Why was that something that was so important for you? And what has that journey been like coming to, from here? I know you've done panels in the past with Laura and even being a part of the documentary on Oxygen. Well, it's just um, such an experience. And you kind of just want to tell your story the more that you get feedback that like oh what you did in that interview or what you said helped me get out of a bad relationship or it helped save my life and so hearing those things like it we want to do more stuff like this to like help other women so that they're not in a situation like ours yeah is there anything you want to add to that yes uh one thing that was really important sharing our story is helping bring awareness uh because I had no idea of red flags or coercive control or any of those. And these days I get up to, sometimes up to 600 emails a day. Wow. And a lot of them are women that are either stuck in a relationship or no longer ashamed, knowing sort of the facts of that they're not the bad guy. The bad guy is the person that tried to con them. 600 emails a day, wow. Laura, this is not a helpless conversation that we're having. You are also working on the advocacy end and change, trying to change laws to make coercive control not only something that we're talking about, but something that we're doing about. Can you talk about your work and what it could mean for the future? Yes, I mean, the Dirty John story, and it's incredibly brave of Deborah to tell her story and courageous to open up her world for everybody to scrutinize and you know for people to judge at times and to blame, and it's given I think thousands of women a voice. It's empowered them to tell their stories too. And we've heard from hundreds of women. Even here today, we've heard from a lot of women. So the first thing is naming it, giving this thing a name, coercive control, the non-physical stuff, the entrapment, the, the rules and the regulations. And having criminalized coercive control in England and Wales in 2015, and it's now a crime in Scotland and Ireland, I'm working with a number of survivors in New York, and we've just introduced a new coercive control law. Senator Kevin Parker is leading uh, on the new law, and I'm hoping that it's going to gain support from many of the other senators. So we're lobbying. I was over in Albany a couple of weeks ago with the survivors, and we went and met with senators. And I can say, did you see Dirty John? 
did you watch the Dirty John, the Dirty Truth on Oxygen? And they all said yes. And I said, well, that's what we're talking about here, coercive control, and we need your support. So the plan that we have currently is East Coast, West Coast that we're targeting first off. And Deborah, you know, is speaking out about it and said, every time we've been interviewed, coercive control should be a crime. Um, and we want people to, uh, we've got a petition that they can sign on change.org. We've got the Victim's Voice Survey, where if you have been victimized in America, you can complete a two-minute survey. It takes very little time. And so far, 98% of victims say they suffered coercive control and it should be criminalized. Um, and there's also, well, we're producing an animated documentary as well about Jennifer Magnano's story. Um, and we really want people to be activists and to work with us so they can reach out to us on social media. Um, please do play a role and, and email right to your senator and say that you think coercive control should be a crime and that serial abusers should be on a register because John was a serial abuser. They can move from victim to victim, from state to state. And I don't think it should be Deborah and Tonya and all the women having to tell each other that somebody's dangerous on women savers or, or other social media platforms. I think this is what the police should be doing, targeting these very dangerous people like John Meehan. Right, and you mentioned to reach out on social media. Where is it that they should be reaching out if, they have, if they're going through something like this? Yeah, so um, I've got a, a website, laurariches.co.uk. There's also Coercive Control, which is a website that they can go on, and that's the American version, uh, where we've got the petition as well. And on Instagram, at laurariches99, and also Twitter, at laurariches999, and Real Crime Profile. On the podcast, we talk a lot about the cases where Coercive Control features. And you know what, Stephanie? It features in most of the cases, both serial killer cases, where serial killers have have had relationships, like Dennis Rader in the, the case he dubbed himself Bind, Torture, Kill, uh, Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer. You know, he was a very sadistic, controlling individual. And with mass shootings, we see coercive control. So we really need to not see this as this is an isolated thing. You know, with the Mohammed and Malvo DC sniper case, that was a stalking and coercive control case. They were trying to track down his ex-wife, Mildred. It wasn't a random set of shootings. So I spent a lot of time joining these dots for society and for professionals because it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Yeah, very true. This is a necessary conversation that doesn't end here and needs to keep going forward and something that we will all be taking a part of and listening to. I want to thank you guys again just for taking the time to talk to us. It's so important that you're here and we're so thankful that you were able to stop by. If anyone at home still wants to learn more about Deborah Tara's story and Laura's input on it, head to auction.com for more information on Dirty John, the Dirty Truth.